Good morning. Today is Friday, November 6th, 2020. We've referred to this verse and this passage a couple of times this week, but this morning I'm going to share a different insight that it holds for us. By Yashkem Avram Baboker, in the middle of our parsha, we learn Avram woke up early in the morning, El Hamakom Asher Amad Sham Hashem, and he stood in the place where he stood before God. Our sages tell us that with this line, Avraham is standing in prayer, the Amida prayer, not necessarily those words because the words were written later in history, but the idea of standing in prayer and the fact that we call that prayer the Amida prayer because it is standing, because the main part of that prayer is that we recognize that we are standing directly in God's presence. In this verse, we learn that Avram established the prayer of Shachris, of the morning prayer. He woke up early in the morning. The Torah tells us that this prayer was in the morning. And the prayer of Shachris, the morning prayer, we have three prayers during the day, Shachris, Mincha, and Marev, morning, afternoon, and evening. The Amidah is virtually identical. The main prayer that we say in each of those three services on a weekday is virtually identical. And yet, the mood, the inflection, and the emotion contained within each of those three prayers is very different one from the other. So, the prayer of Shachris, established by Avram in the morning, is a prayer of optimism, a prayer of reassurance, a prayer of compassion and kindness. And we reflect that in lots of different ways in the prayer that we say in the morning, as opposed to, for example, to take the opposite, Mar of the evening prayer, which was established by Yaakov, which was established at night during a time when he was vulnerable, during a time when he was in exile, running away. And his prayer reflects that emotional and historical experience, or as opposed to Avraham's prayer that are, reflects his emotional and historical experience. Shachris is a prayer of brightness and optimism and confidence looking forward to the new day with the dawn of a new day. What is fascinating, once we accept that, is the context of this Pasuk in which Avraham establishes this prayer. Because, and we discussed this earlier this week, Avraham stands in the morning, gets up in the morning and stands in prayer before God. And he looks out over the area of Sodom and Amorah. This is the day after Sodom and Amorah were destroyed. <coughs> and all of the valley that is below him. Vayar and Avraham sees Vihine Allah Kitor Haaretz Kikitor Hakibshan. The smoke rising from the destroyed cities of Sodom and Amorah is like the smoke rising from a furnace. This prayer is the day after Avraham had stood negotiating with God to try to save Sodom. And ultimately, Avraham was unsuccessful. Avraham failed to save the city of Sodom, and it was destroyed. And the next morning, Avram gets up, he stands in prayer, as he is looking at the evidence of his failure from the day before, and the utter destruction that surrounds him, Avraham, what does he do? 
Try to imagine for a moment what it must have felt like, just in human terms, to intercede with God, to have the holy chutzpah, to argue with God that he should save the people of Sodom. And to have this encounter with God where they're negotiating, if they're 50 people and they're 40 or 35, if they're 10 people, and what kind of people, as we discussed last night, and to fail. He didn't get what he wanted. And then how is it possible for him the next morning to stand and not only to offer, but to institute for all time, to establish for all time a prayer of confidence and optimism and compassion? How is that possible? So this is a, a fundamental principle. We've discussed it in different contexts before. Prayer is not about getting what you want. It can lead to that. But that is the secondary goal of prayer. The primary goal of prayer is the relationship with God. It's the encounter with God. And in the encounter with God that Avram has concerning the people of Sodom, where God says, I'm going to destroy the people of Sodom, and Avram says, Hashofet kol haaretz lo yase mishpat, will the judge of the entire world not deal justly? Save the entire city. On if, if we can find there 50 right, righteous people in the midst of the city. And then it goes down to 10. And God is willing to agree to even 10. Okay. Ultimately, the answer was no. Presumably, God did not find 10 in that city. Maybe he found less than 10. Ultimately, the answer was no. But that's not the primary aspect of the prayer. What does that encounter tell us about the primary aspect of having a relationship with God? Well, God listened. God responded. There was an interaction. God was willing to accept Avraham's position and Avraham's proposal. In terms of having a relationship, that prayer was a tremendous success. It didn't lead to the outcome that Abraham wanted, but that's not the purpose of prayer. In other words, on the surface, the interaction between God and Abraham concerning Sodom, if there are 50 people and 40 and 30 and finally 10, sounds like an interaction, a conversation, a negotiation. What Avraham is teaching us is, no, that is prayer. That's what prayer is. And I succeeded in that prayer. It worked. And on the strength of it working, yes, I'm standing in the same spot. I see that I did not get what I asked for. Yes, that is tragic. Yes, but... I accept, Avraham says to himself, sometimes God's answer is no. I accept that. But the ability to have a relationship, the ability to wake up in the morning and to address God and that God is listening and that God will respond, I'm absolutely convinced. It happened. That's exactly what happened. And so Avraham establishes the morning prayer on the basis of his success in the interaction the day before concerning Sodom. We have two main problems with prayer today. Prayer is, <clears throat> I speak about it a lot because it needs a lot of attention. Two main problems. One main problem of prayer is that many people 
have an unrealistic expectation of getting what we ask for. And that can lead us, when we don't get what we ask for, to view prayer as futile. God forbid someone is sick. We pray for them to get better and we pray with sincerity and feeling and emotion and spirituality and Nebuchadnezzar, the person passes away, God forbid. So I say to myself, so what's the use? What's the pro It didn't work. What's the use? So the next time someone is sick, I'm going to waste my time praying? I mean, it didn't do any good. That's a shame. That's a terrible shame. But I really think in my experience and from what people say to me, I think this is very widespread. That people's being distant from prayer, being distant from shul, often comes from an experience like this in whatever area of life where there was something important and I felt that I prayed for it and it didn't happen. And then what's the use? Why should I bother? It's a shame because it is a misunderstanding of what prayer is. It's a misunderstanding of what should be our realistic expectations about prayer. Avraham understood. And because of that, he was able to establish Shachris the next day. We need to remember what Avraham understood. The second major problem that we have with prayer today is that if we accept that the primary goal of prayer is to have a relationship with God, many of us don't sense a need to have a relationship with God. Many are not looking for that relationship with God. For many people, that is not something to work towards. And that is the essence of a secular outlook on life, even for people who are observant of mitzvahs. A person can observe Shabbat, a person can keep kosher, but still have a secular orientation in life in the sense that their life is filled with the people that they see and the things that they do, but there is not a spiritual component that goes beyond this world that connects with God. They're not looking for it. It's not necessary. They're not missing it. And if you're not missing it, you're not going to look for it. And that's a shame. Because we have to work to change that attitude. Because the truth is, it would change our lives if we had the real sense that we are never alone. Because that's what it means to have a relationship with God. People who are lonely. Yes, I understand today people are in very, very difficult situations. And thank God I'm not in that complete situation and so I'm not able to completely relate to someone who literally is living alone and can't go out and what they feel. I understand that that's something that is terribly serious. But let's develop this sense through prayer. You are never alone. The famous line from Tehillim that we say at the end of our benching, Birkat Amazon, and it's a problematic line because it doesn't seem to be correct. But let's look at it again. Nar ha'yisi v'gam zakanti v'lo ra'yisi tzadik nezov v'zara mavakesh lachem. The next to the last line we say in the benching Birkat Amazon. Nar ha'yisi, I was young and even now I'm old and I never saw a person deserted by God going hungry. What do you mean? You never saw a person go hungry? Every day I have people coming to me who are hungry. Every day I'm trying to help people who are hungry. There are people who are hungry all over. Even in a place like Hampstead, there are people that are having difficulty putting meals on the table, especially just to go out of our, commu our, our little bubble of a community. What do you mean? You never saw a person who was hungry? That's not what David means. 
Nar ha'isi v'gam zakanti v'laraisi tzadik nezav. I never saw a righteous person who understood the importance of having a relationship with God who even if he or she is hungry, felt nezov, felt neglected, distanced from God, abandoned by God. That we don't find. Because a tzaddik is one who understands, even if I am missing something, even if I am hungry, but at least God is with me. At least God is by my side. So it's a real shame not to realize and work on and prioritize having a relationship with God because it would change our lives. And it's also a shame because God wants a relationship with us. Famous story is told about a great rabbi, Rabbi Chaim Soloveitchik. He was once learning Torah in his study and his grandchildren and some friends were playing outside. And one of his grandchildren ran into his study and he was crying. And Ruchayim said to him, My child, why are you crying? And the little boy said, We're all playing, playing hide and go seek. And I was hiding. And everybody else decided not to come look for me. And his grandfather also started to cry. And he said, you know, God feels the same way. Because God is hidden now in this era. We don't see God openly. God is hidden. But God wants us to look for him. God wants us to search for him. God wants us to open lines of communication and relationship with him, primarily through prayer. And we're not looking. We're not searching. God wants us to come looking for him. And we're not missing him. We're not searching. God is hidden now. But the mitzvah of prayer especially as established by Avraham, and especially within the context of this specific prayer that establishes Shachris, God wants us to seek God and wants to respond to us just as he responded to Avraham. That's the lesson we need to take from the first prayer where God where Avram intercedes on behalf of Sodom, and then the second prayer, where in spite of failing at that task, Avram succeeds in establishing the confident, optimistic prayer of Shachris. My friends, I wish you a great day, a wonderful Shabbos, and I hope that all of us are able to share and drink up the attitude towards prayer that we learn from Avraham in this week's Parsha. Have a great Shabbos.